Welcome to the Schmidt House Podcast. I'm your host, Zach. On today's episode, I'm continuing my Harry Potter series with the third book slash movie review, The Prisoner of Azkaban. I solemnly swear that I am up to no good. So for this review, I listened to this book on audiobook just to save some time. So if you want to follow along with me, I have it uh, linked in the description box. I listened to the Stephen Fry version but the Jim Dale version is just as good. I'm going to talk about the book first, then the movie, and get into a general overview to finish it all off. And now to the Prisoner of Azkaban review. Once again, J.K.'s writing of the Dursleys, and specifically Aunt Marge, is done so well. She writes them really, really good, and it just makes you dislike them every single page that you read. Marge is quite possibly more awful than the Dursleys, In contrast to this, the next chapter, she shows how much more enjoyable the Wizarding World is. You can actually feel such a large tone shift in the writing that uh, really illustrates that. When the Firebolt is introduced, it says that there's uh, unbreakable charms put on it, which is kind of ironic since his Nimbus 2000 breaks this book. So there is maybe a little bit of foreshadowing there. But realistically, it could have been bought before his school year, and it would have saved him some headache later on the in the year. But he, you know, including in that, if he bought that broom, he could have given it to his old broom to Ron, which would have probably helped him out later on in the books when Ron decides to join the Quidditch team. But there is just a bit of irony around that simple note about the Firebolt being unbreakable. When Harry is in uh, getting his books in Flourish and Blots, he noticed a book called Broken Balls When Fortune Turns Foul. I wonder if this is a hint towards the prophecies in the fifth book or simply just a reference to crystal balls in general, maybe even the one that Hermione knocks over when she quits um, divination. This is also the first time that we hear about the horseless carriages. I wonder if she meant she truly meant them to be bewitched or if she meant for them to be drawn by thestrals you know when she was kind of coming up for this uh you know at this point in the series she did say that she or she put in the books that harry expected to have invisible horses being you know drawing the carriages so who really knows but i in my mind i expect that she meant them just to be bewitched which uh you know it's not mentioned by any of the students uh, up until basically the fifth book that they are drawn by Thestrals. So that's kind of just my pre, uh, my ass- assumption on that. J.K. Uh, writes, Certain aspects of Harry's life so depressive, and it would really pain many people to be haunted in the way that Harry is. It's, cu- it's um, talked about a, a couple of times throughout the series, but in this book specifically, if you look at his interactions with the Dementors, He's constantly reminded of his mother's death, his his mother's death, and here's the memory of her screams whenever he comes across the Dementors. It's really heartbreaking, and if you try to put yourself in his shoes, not just to be orphaned and have tons of bad things constantly happening to you, but to have so much deep-seated pain that is constantly being brought to the surface. This really showcase is really showcased when um, when Harry is taking the Patronus lessons with Professor Lupin. He actually wants to hear his parents' voices, and it's really sad. I think a real-life analogy for this would be having to fight um, crippling depression just to be able to hear a five-second recording of your dead parents talk. I'm sure that, um, that many in that situation, you know, would go through that, but it is a large thing to sacrifice. And this book particularly... You can see a shift towards more adult themes, um, more so than the prior two. I mean, it, they are the people in the books are getting a bit older, so it makes a little bit of sense. But particularly this uh, this one, it does get darker. And if you you know zoom out and look at the series as a whole, one of the main themes throughout it is death. So it's kind of starting to really kind of turn just a little bit uh, in this book. It's kind of funny that uh, that Hermione thinks that Harry's firebolt was sent by Sirius because it was, but just not under the pre uh, presumed pretenses that uh, Hermione had thought. Hermione also figures out that Lupin is a werewolf and almost tells the boys about it. It's a very short exchange, and it could be missed if you aren't paying attention. 
I for sure didn't pick up on it uh, when I was younger, that she almost gives it away. The Quidditch final uh, was some of the best Quidditch written uh, in all of the books. It's very descriptive. It has lots of tense moments in it, and it finishes with a great triumph. Um, This is something that needed to be in the movie, in my opinion. Having Quidditch being ignored so much more so in the movies than the books, which Quidditch is often ignored in the books, I think is a major mistake. Quidditch is one of the fan favorite things in the whole series, and it's often cut for other plot lines, say the Triwizard Tournament in the next book. Um, you know, and, and it, again, it's cut more so in the movies. Like, it's just completely ignored outside of the one game um, in this movie. But I think uh, it's just... It, it kind of showcases some at some level some weak writing, and I really wish it um, played out a bit differently. The reveal at the end is a very well constructed puzzle. There are little things that you know are are not so blatant clues that are throughout the book that lead to the end conclusion, and it's not so much a mystery novel as as the second book is. I think it's more of a puzzle, and I think that it's way more well thought out of and uh, more complete in comparison to the prior entries. I'm really glad that she didn't fully introduce Animagi in this book. The first time that we see one without any explanation is in the first chapter of the first book with Professor McGonagall, and I think it's thoroughly expand expanded upon and explained in this book and I'm glad that there are some things that aren't just shoehorned uh, just to make the plot make sense which her writing is um, typically plagued with. Ron really experiences some cognitive dissonance when he's uh, told that his rat is Peter Pettigrew. He tries really really hard to um, discount what everyone's saying and uh, even despite when faced with like some hard evidence such as it missing a finger and it being so old and lots of things that maybe he just hadn't come to terms with yet but it's funny to see it actually play out uh, on, on paper the chapters in the streaking shack are really a turning point for not just the series but for jk as a whole this resolution was really well thought out and it had so many intertwining plot lines that are all coming out to a very fair conclusion. And it really shows that um, this is the book where she caught stride. It's chapters like these that is, you know, it really showcases what Harry Potter books are all about. It has the summation of different plot lines, mysteries and puzzles, and has tons of emotional impact as well. And um, I, I find that it's this book where she really figured out not a formula, but she figured out how to express lots of these things really well. In the last chapter, there's uh, another example of um, Fudge's vanity when he comes, uh, it comes to, he's only concerned with his popularity with the Daily Prophet and not the relevance of recent events and the fact that he's willing to execute someone, uh, execute um, an, an innocent man just so that he can look good in the papers. And it's very, like, it's very stereotypical of what you would see, from my opinion, that 99% of politicians are like. And I think this also sets up his character arc for how he acts in the fifth book. It must provide uh, Harry a certain level of comfort that his cor- uh, corporal Patronus is, be- is a stag. It metaphorically represents his father's protection over him, uh, you know, when he's at his saddest and most depressed due to a Dementor trying to make him remember the worst night of his life. It's very poetic. You know, that's it's, it's um, explained multiple times that his mother's love and her magical ability gave Harry a certain level of protection. But it does, it kind of um, takes away from lots of the things that uh, connects Harry with James. And his stag Patronus is one that really grounds him. Uh, you know, with the um, the love of his father, which I think I think it's really cool. This is uh this is the first book where she hints upon um, plot lines that are going to kick off the next book um, towards the end of um, this book. This uh, is involving Harry visiting the borough again in the Quidditch World Cup, and it's a good tease in showcasing that there's more evolved plan for the series as a whole just um, prior to finishing a single book, um, more so than the two two previous books. Now, I do have a, a bone to pick with the Dementors being at the school. 
they're essentially using Harry as bait to catch Sirius at, at this point. I really don't feel that their presence is justified, um, you know, especially having the ability to put so many others in danger, especially young kids. It just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, it could, it could, one of them could be wrongfully kissed by a Dementor just so they can, like, lure um, Sirius to and use Harry as bait. It just doesn't really make sense. I think if their goal was to catch Sirius, then Ors would be a lot better option. Like, to kind of bring this back to a real-world scenario, if a prisoner escapes in the muggle world, you don't send the prison guards to find them. You use your existing police, and it just doesn't really make sense to use the Dementors. JK often has uh, points of really lazy writing. She gets uh, the dates of the full moons wrong th throughout the book. Uh, the attempts are close, but it's really frustrating when, um, you know, to keep trying to have some level of realism within the series and you're getting like dates and things like that wrong. Even when writing the book, it wouldn't have been hard to find the moon phases in 1993 and 1994, especially when the plot of the book revolves around a werewolf. And in my opinion, it would have been better to be factual on this and make the world feel lived in. It's not a huge issue, to be honest, uh, as the dates aren't that far off, but um, I don't think it would be safe for Lupin to be on the train with kids considering September 1st was a full moon. So, plus, he could have just apparated to the school, so or at least to Hogsmeade. But uh, another thing, why would Fred and George... This is, a, this is a big frustration. Why would Fred and George give Harry the Marauder's map? They obviously do not know any connection with it uh, and his father... And it's an insanely useful item that is just extremely overpowered. Just to give him the opportunity to go to Hogsmeade, they're going to give up something that useful. Um, like, they could have just showed and told him how to get there. But having an item of its capabilities is far, far too useful to be given away, especially considering that they still have two and a half years left of school. And I would understand them leaving it with Ron after they're done, but why Harry just to get him to Hogsmeade? It just doesn't make sense. There's also a glaring plot hole that, um, you know, the twins never noticed that Ron was sleeping with a man named Peter Pettigrew in his bed every night. Um, you know, or even that they probably could have figured out where the entrance to the Chamber of Secrets was um, in the last book. You know, unless maybe it's unplottable or guarded by the Fidelius charm like I had uh, explained in the previous episode. Um, but there's also two other plot holes that this book creates. One is the uh, Fidelius charm, a.k.a. the secret, keep, secret keeper's uh, charm, and the subject of time travel. So whenever there is time travel there in, in any type of medium, there's usually big plot holes that come along with it. I'm going to address some of these a little bit later. Um, Fudge, in the scene where he talks with the teachers about Sirius Black, uh, he even suspects that Voldemort would rise again, and if Sirius returned to him under the assumption that Sirius was one of his followers, Fudge knew that Voldemort would come back. Yet, two books later, he is in complete denial. It seems a bit odd that someone would be searching for Sirius so relentlessly, uh, but to ignore the suspected end result of why they were searching for him two books later. Maybe this plays out differently in the next book um, that would make things make a little bit more sense that I'm just forgetting, um, so maybe it'll flesh out later. But I don't, also don't understand um, the whole Christmas at Hogwarts thing, specifically in this book. Uh, why not just send all of the students home or at least maybe to a friend's house or whatever? I mean, it just doesn't make sense, you know, especially considering there's only 13 people in all of Hogwarts that stayed for the Christmas feast. Um, JK was also off on the moon phases by a couple of days for Lupin, and the teachers were openly talking about his potions and his affliction um, with students around. And it seemed that the whole portion of this chapter was just to add more information about Lupin missing things. Um, I also find it odd that the teachers stayed behind as well. Like, don't these people have families and stuff? Um, <clears throat> I think this would have been an easy thing for the trio just to go to the borough and you can come back and divulge lots of the other plot lines and sort some stuff out with Lupin at a, at, you know, at a, in, in a different way later on in the book. Uh, Professor Trelawney is one of the most annoying teachers at Hogwarts. She's by far my least favorite. Um, at, at this point, there are some other teachers that come later on that are, you know, more hated, but Trelawney is just 
she would def- if she was my teacher, I would have left class the very first day. This book does have some pacing problems in the second half. It seems that everything was hit the accelerator for a time uh, after um, Christmas. There's a lot to unpack over the course of about eight hours that occupies the bulk of the final chapters, but it just seemed after Christmas, just lots of things just happened quite quickly. Um, since these people are magic and there is a killing curse, why would they use an ax, uh, as means to as means of an execution form for Buckbeat rather than just using magic. That never really made sense to me, um, even when I was a kid. A huge problem with the capture of Sirius is uh, you know, there's obviously new evidence that could have been brought to light, and they're really quick to administer the Dementor's kiss rather than wait for Lupin to transform from a werewolf and confirm their story. Um, even if there are large prejudices against werewolves and, and them being old friends, I think that um, they should have done, what they should have done is parked some oars outside of where they kept him and gave Sirius a day in court. They really haven't talked to any eyewitnesses at this point and we're just ready to kill him. Um, I know there's obviously a history and, and all of that stuff and he's an escaped convict, but, you know, Snape has Veritas Serum, which is a, tr- which is a truth potion. Um, this could have been administered to the kids, to Sirius, to Lupin, and would bypass the confundus charm that Snape said Sirius put on them. And realistically, the existence of Veritas Serum makes courts redundant as you could get, you know, the truthful information from the accused all the time. Um, now let's address one of the largest problems in this series as a whole. Who on their right mind gives the power of time travel to a 13 year old kid? Just so, just so that they can attend more classes. Um, I mean, 13 year olds are for sure not smart enough to not abuse it and have no idea about the complexity of time. I don't understand why she decides to use, like JK decides to use this. Um, all of these plot lines could have worked out with the same result without the use of the time turner. And it almost just opens things up for scrutiny and plot holes to no additional benefit. Um, and this is obviously, she tries to kind of um, rectify this in the, in the fifth book when she destroys all the time turners. But then for some reason, um, I'm not going to comment on the Chris child because it's absolutely terrible, but they start using time turners um, in that book. And that's a large plot point and it just destroys so much stuff. So for, for her to kind of introduce this just seemed unnecessary to kind of keep it simple. But, um, you know, Hermione also says how important it is to not be seen, but she literally attends extra classes every single week where her classmates see her all the time. Um, it's explicitly says that in the book. So, um, there's just, it opens it up for scrutiny where it just didn't need to. I really think that there's a, a couple of really easy ways of how to go about this in a um, natural way that didn't include time travel and have the exact same result. Um, Wizards also can't do math because Hermione got 320% on her Muggle study study final. So unless there are triple the amount of bonus questions than regular questions on the test, it just doesn't really make sense. I don't know why she tried, why JK tried to like make it look so different. And now on to the movie. So Aunt Marge is perfectly terrible in this movie, just as much as she is in the book. This scene is quite funny, and the music adds so well to the chaos and everything that's going on. There are a couple of really cool shots where the camera goes through glass or a mirror, and they're really unique and creative shots. They're done a couple times through the movie, and it's it's really well done. Um, the big one that stands out for me is when the camera goes through the mirror in the cupboard when they're, um, learning about the bog art. Uh, the director does some really creative shots. Um, one of my favorites is the, in the leaky cauldron when Arthur Weasley talks to Harry about Sirius. This plays out differently in the book, but I think it's better in the movie. This shot looks like it's all one, a one long take. And I'm not sure if that's just good editing or it was actually shot in one take, but it's done so well. And there's so much going on in the background that you can watch it and listen to it a few times in a row and see the complexity of what's actually going on in the scene. It's probably one of the best scenes in the film. 
I think that the scene where Harry gets the Marauders map and learns about Sirius Black and the three, three broomsticks plays out better in the movie when compared to the books. Obviously, there's more context in the books, but it makes more sense for him to have the invisibility cloak walking around Hogsmeade rather than being hidden behind a tree. Um, we also get introduced to Michael Gambon as Dumbledore. Uh, he's the replacement to Richard Harris, who passed away. I do prefer Michael Gambon's Dumbledore, and his performance is one of the movie's most redeeming qualities, uh, in my opinion. Uh, his voice and on-screen presence works better than Harris. Um, Harris just seemed for a bit too old. Uh, but again, that's just my preference. I'm sure many, uh, you know, some people might disagree. There's a really fun scene uh, after the um, welcome feast where the third year Gryffindor boys are playing with some candy that changes their voices to that of animals. Uh, it's a really great scene. Uh, it wasn't in the books, but it works really well. And I'm glad that uh, it was included. Um, you know, I just have um, some questions on why some other things were added. I'll probably talk about that later. Uh, there's a couple aesthetic changes to the castle and the grounds that do work well. I like the bridge, the stone circle, um, you know, and, and the uh, clock courtyard area. It's really neat. Um, Professor Trelawney, while being one of my most disliked characters in the book, uh, was really well cast having Emma Thompson. Um, she looks exactly as she is described in the book, so that was really well done. I like Hermione's mocking of divination. It was really well acted by Emma Watson uh, during the scenes and the interactions with her and Trelawney. Uh, Seamus does not know how to tie a tie whatsoever. Seriously, if you look at him in any scene, it's always just horribly done. Uh, the tail will be super long and the front part will be like really fat and close to his neck. And it's just, it's not just in this movie, but in the series as a whole. So if you watch these uh, again sometime soon, we'll look out for um, Seamus's ties. The CGI on Buckbeak is really well done, and it holds up. John Williams, once again, nails it with the score. The score is a bit different than the first two. You can tell there are some reused themes, but lots of it's so expanded on, upon. A um, couple of highlights, you know, when the night bus comes around the corner and its theme comes on, it just it's really well done. Buckbeak's theme is also pretty good. Uh, the heavy drums to start it isn't my favorite, but what follows is really good. And they use that theme a couple of times throughout the movie. Um, so this score is both familiar, uh, but fresh at the same time. Uh, you know, this is the last one that John Williams did. He only did the first three. Um, but some of his themes are still carried throughout just to have some um, continuity between the uh, the movies. Alan Rickman's acting as Snape is so menacing, and it and he is really the best actor at their character of anyone in the series. He in every single scene, Snape is the best. Uh, they sort of um, combine the Hogsmeade scenes for the movie, which I think works good as it saves some time. Uh, but it does cause them to have to change a, a you know a couple of plot lines later on. The motif of adding crows and ravens where Buckbeak is prior to his scheduled execution is a very nice theatrical touch. Gary Oldman uh, being cast as Sirius was really good. Um, and his design for the costume and the acting, everything is just so well done. Um, you know, he really does look like he spent the last 12 years in, in, um, in Azkaban. The Shrieking Shack scenes were... Really well shot. I like the whole. I liked that the whole building was seemed to be moving and creaking, and it was a really cool way to add a haunting motif to the to the setting that the characters were in. There are also little notes, and I'm I'm pretty sure this is just a sound effect. It's not actually part of the score, but whenever there is a mysterious event happening, there's some sort of string instrument that's playing a certain tone, and it's a really nice touch. It just makes you feel a little bit on edge or eerie. The back in time sequences were really well done, even down to the sound effects, which has like a, a ticking a ticking clock tone played throughout the score uh, for the most of it, which adds to the intensity and the sense of urgency during those scenes. Uh, the end credits were also really creatively done with the Marauders map, and it's a good addition to that of the prior films, which just had a uh, plain black with white white writing. Uh, this had it was just a lot more involved and I think they do carry certain aspects of, of that throughout the rest of the series as well. 
So uh, this movie is directed by Alfonso Cuaron. Uh, this is his first and only film in the series. I do give him props for doing some creative things with the movie, but um, you know this was a movie that I f- that it for sure would have had a higher ranking when I was a kid, but it doesn't hold up nearly as good. Uh, I'm going to start out by saying that there were way too many uh, deviations from the book and took way too many creative liberties um, that some of that were welcomed, but majority of them weren't. Uh, you know, this, I, in my opinion, this was the one book that would have been the easiest to knock out of the park. You had, uh, you know, two prior entries that basically laid the groundwork for everything that you, you know, you didn't have to introduce the setting. You didn't have to find the actors. You didn't have to do lots of the things. So the groundwork was already there. Um, it just had really good potential to flow from the book to translate to something on screen. And, uh, you know, this movie, I think, is often most revered by fans who probably haven't read the books, but it's not nearly as good as it should be. And again, I'm sure that this is a good movie for those who haven't read the books, but I think that it it just, there didn't need to be so many things changed. Um, This book had probably the perfect length um, to be able to translate it. There's easy things that you could have cut. Um... But it just seemed that lots of the things that they did didn't didn't really work out, in my opinion. So I'm going to point some of these things out. Um, you know, if you look at, say, this book, this is the the length where it's like as much should have been included because the other books that are after this are for sure too long to actually translate to something on screen. So I'm not going to comment in the future um, future reviews about lots of the changes specifically, but I am going to nitpick this one a little bit more just because I don't think that it was fully necessary. Okay, so now that that's all out of the way, we're going to open with, yet again, another instance of Harry doing magic outside of school. We are told so many times that they're not allowed, that it's not allowed to happen, and it just seems that they enjoy violating it in every single movie. I do, however, like the cool effect of Harry uh, using Lumos and, and reading his textbooks, um in bed. Um, you know, I, I mean, he does live in the muggle world, could have a light. It's just as easy to turn that on and off and not uh, have the ministry of magic breathing down your neck. But again, just a, a a little creative thing that, uh, I don't think plays out as well as, um, most people maybe appreciate it. But another thing is the shrunken heads on the night bus. It's something that I really never cared for. I thought it was stupid when I was, uh, 13 or whenever this movie came out. I didn't understand why they were there, why they were put in the movie um, way back then, and and even watching it today still doesn't, uh, it still doesn't hold up. I don't like the recasting of Tom the Barman uh, for for the Leaky Cauldron. When I first watched it, I didn't realize who it was and that they had actually replaced that character. It doesn't fit. It is a cool characterization, but it's not true to the book. And honestly, you're just sitting there and being like, who the heck is this hunchback person? Um, but again, it is a really cool aesthetic. They completely destroyed, uh, the passing of time in regards to ending the summer and getting to school. Um, I really like lots of those scenes in the book and Harry spending the summer at the Leaky Cauldron and in Diagon Alley. Um, it's shameful not to include it. Us muggles like living in the wizarding world and some of the best parts of it is seeing sets like Diagon Alley and stuff like that. So especially not seeing the Firebolt. Uh, it just sets up for future disappointment. I really wish they would have included a little bit more of the pre-Hogwarts um, stories. Um, and that brings me to the subject of the Firebolt. So this is probably one of my biggest pet peeves about the movie. It drives me crazy every single time I watch it. I even remember it annoying me the first time I watched it in the theater. Just including it at the end was so dumb. Um, you know, there's a lot of drama in the book regarding the broom, uh, even just between the trio and broomsticks are really cool. And just something that I wanted to see more of. And they've been, you know, it's, it would have been really enjoyable to see that, uh, on film rather than just the last, you know, 10, 15 seconds at the end of the movie. Um, you know, so it should have been shown at Diagon Alley. It should have been given to Harry at Christmas time. Um, even if they were still going to ignore the, the latter um, Quidditch games, um, still they could have included the Firebolt in the movie. 
Uh, Dementors also do not turn things to ice. I, I, when I first saw it, I envisioned them to look a little bit different. I expected them to look a little bit more like the ring wraiths from Lord of the Rings rather than, um, what they, like, it's not terrible. It's just, you know, my expectation of what I saw on screen, it just didn't really match up, but that's probably just a me thing. Uh, they absolutely shit on um, Professor Flitwick's character. They make him more like a clown. He's got really long, extended shoes and feet and stuff like that. And um, they change up the way he looks. Um, and then they make him the... They don't even say that he's the charms professor. He's basically the conductor of the school slash frog choir. Um, it's so dumb. This was not in the books and it was another unnecessary addition. I don't know why. It seems, in my mind, it's the stupidest addition to the movie. They should have kept it closer with the books. The Frog Choir is one of the stupidest things in the entire film series, and, and I'll plant my flag on that. Um, they moved the pa the portrait of the fat lady from the corridor like it was in the past two films to, um, and in the books, for that matter, um, to the Grand Staircase. Uh, and if you actually see when the students are coming up to her, if you look in the bottom right of the screen, there's a portrait of someone that has the, you know, looks fairly similar to Voldemort. I'm going to rag on here for a second, but uh, probably my biggest dislike of this movie is the additional boy in Gryffindor. I don't even think they gave him a name uh, in in the movie, but he's not in the books. He's not a canon character. Um, you know, the, the five students in Harry's grade are Dean, Neville, Seamus, Ron, and Harry. And they just threw an additional boy in there for some stupid reason. Um, you know, he's basically just used as an exposition character that you literally could have given those lines to any other uh, canon character in the movie and it would have worked out. But instead they made up a character and just put him in Gryffindor. For no apparent reason and just to give these exposition lines to it has it has no purpose it's so stupid um i don't even think you really see dean thomas um very much in the, in, in the movie like you could have given his his lines to him or seamus or, or like honestly anybody but they just made up this character for god knows what reason and um yeah, it just really doesn't fit. It's every single time I watch it, it annoys the hell out of me. And if anybody, um, if you agree with me, please let me know I'm not crazy in the comments because even the first time watching it, it just drove me crazy. I'm like, who the heck is this place? I actually, I think I, I, um, even did think I'm like, did they replace Dean Thomas with that person? Like, it's just weird. So, but I'm going to move on. Um, during the Quidditch scene, Harry sees the Grimm in the cloud, and I think they should have stuck closer to the books where Sirius is actually in the stands. Again, just another thing I don't quite understand why they changed it. Now, there are, uh, just like the book, there are some pacing issues regarding time jumps. It shows things, um, you, you know, to, to showcase the passing of time, they show changing of the seasons, very similar to what they did in the other movies. But it just doesn't feel like it addresses where they are time-wise, like Christmas is completely bypassed um, and so are a more majority of important events such as Quidditch and everything just rushes by. Um, and there isn't, it's not an even passage of time. So essentially if you, if you time, time stamp the movie, the last half of the movie is the last quarter of the book. So it just feels really choppy in the way that they progress the plot. It just, it, it just feels so uneven. Um, and it just doesn't feel like you're exploring Harry at school. You're more or less just like, okay, we need to see Harry doing this. And then we need to advance to this point in the story and see Harry doing this. You know, it just, it just doesn't really feel cohesive. And I think, um, I think this is the worst done for that aspect of any of the movies. Uh, Harry also doesn't see Pettigrew on the map in the book. And it's odd that they decided to put the scene in the movie the way that it does. And, you know, with, with Lupin and, and Snape and all that, um, it doesn't really need to be there. Uh, you know, they needed to showcase this in a different way because they modified the Hogsmeade scenes. But um, this part definitely does play out better in the books. Um, the whole interaction with Snape, Lupin, Harry, and the Marauders map. Um, but it, to be honest, it just doesn't, 
it doesn't make any sense. And it's in my mind, it's lazy writing at its finest because if Harry was going to go wander the castle at night, he would have taken his invisibil- invisibility cloak and this whole thing would have just been a non-issue. So it just, it's, they all honestly like changed the Hogsmeade scenes and they're like, oh crap, we can't do this later scene. So we're just going to write something and hope it sticks. Uh, and, and it doesn't. Uh, the shri- the scene in the Shrieking Shack plays out better in the books rather than the movie. I mean, that does make sense. There's a lot to unpack. Uh, they do a good job at it in the um, in the movie, but there's just a couple of things where it's like just the plot is fleshed out a little bit more. And again, if they took that much time to detail it in the way that they did and a lot that much time, the second half of the um, movie to go over lots of that stuff, um, it probably just could have played out a little bit better. The trio's acting is slightly weak when it comes to the emotional scenes. They are getting better and more settled into their roles, but there's a scene where Hermione's crying on Ron's shoulder, and it just is the fakest thing ever. Um, But again, they're they're young when they're acting, so I don't you know I don't blame them for that. But it's just you can kind of see it come through on screen. Uh, The Whomping Willow scene, uh, I think they tried to make it a little bit more action than it is than it was necessary. And it ends up just being treated of somewhat like comic relief. They didn't know what they were actually going to do with this scene, it seems. Uh, and it doesn't hold up. And it's probably among the worst scenes in the movie. I never really liked the werewolf aesthetic that they used in the film. They made it uh, a little bit too derivative. There's no tail. There's not enough fur. Uh, and it's a bit skinny for what, you know, I think most people would envision a werewolf to be. Um that's kind of just my thoughts. I think maybe maybe some other people liked it, it's, but I think it's a little bit more human the wolf. I think it should have definitely at least had a little bit more fur, if anything. Uh, in the Dementor scene, when they're back in time, they don't show Harry's uh, corporal Patronus uh, of the stag. So there's a large error here, and I'm not sure why. Um, not just from a movie standpoint, but from a book, like you're expecting Harry to be able to cast the stag Patronus and it just doesn't. It's just some, some really powerful white stuff just blasting on the screen, uh, as odd, as odd as that sounds. But, um, I don't know why they didn't put the stag in because you see it like from the other angle when they're in regular time, why wouldn't it exist back in time? I don't, I don't know what's going on there. Um, another minus point for for this movie and then we're going to close out with the firebolt scene at the end it's just it's terribly dumb dumb and uh you know even down to the blurring of harry's face to close out the movie it's just really silly like it would have had like a better freeze frame for having the trio hold hands and jump up in the air um you know or have harry punch the sky like he's in um breakfast at tiffany's or breakfast club or some stupid movie from the 80s that's honestly how how stupid this scene does it does not fit it's not um relevant in the times of movie making either it's it, like it, it's an embarrassing way to finish the movie in my opinion all right now some overall comments on um prisoner of Azkaban. i found it funny that dudley was paid 20 pounds to cooperate with his aunt uh so in today's money that would be approximately 70 dollars canadian and that was just to get a hug and a kiss from from her so, uh, I mean, his parents pay him pretty well just to not be annoyed by his aunt. JK has said that the Dementors are a metaphor for depression. And it's funny that chocolate helps with the symptoms of Dementors. I don't quite think that's how it really works, but I'm sure um, people have probably tried to cure depression with chocolate or at very least ice cream. I think JK uh, was really setting up Crookshanks to be an animagus. That's at least how it seems from some of her depictions. So I don't know if it was an abandoned plot line from this book or something she was going to reveal later on um, and ended up abandoning it altogether. I know there is always a fan theory that many people, um, you know, thought that Crookshanks was an animagus. Uh, I certainly did. Uh, I was always looking for that to be answered. I feel really bad for Sirius Black. He's probably one of my top three characters in the series. And he loses his best friends, he's framed for a crime, spends 12 years in Azkaban, finally is able to give himself and Harry a better life, and is vilified and forced back into hiding. Uh, Sirius is quite possibly one of the most important characters in the series because, um, you know, had he not suggested to change the Secret Keeper to Pettigrew, Voldemort would 
not have met his end fate in the same way. Uh, sure, there probably would have been a completely different story, obviously. Um, but that timeline could have had more bloodshed, you know, not the way it's not the way that the story went, obviously. Um, but perhaps, uh, they would have trained Harry to be a champion of death rather than, um, you know, being stricken with the killing curse or perhaps Voldemort would have just went after Neville and succeeded and, you know, ended up conquering the wizarding world. So it's, it's actually funny when you, when you draw back the entire storylines, that simple action that, you know, was just probably a simple oversight set the tone for the entire series. So Sirius is a very important character. Uh, so Hermione was taking two extra classes, which approximately uh, boiled down to an extra two weeks or 336 extra hours of class time over the school year. And I'm sure that it's not fun, especially considering the extra studying. Um, but I don't understand why the school would let her do this and even why they would let a 13-year-old mess with something in a sensitive time just to take those extra classes. She easily could have worked it out to take the classes over the summer, and I'm sure she probably would have enjoyed that more. One major plot hole that I never really understood is how the Bogart gets the powers of a Dementor, and it just opens up for speculation on what other dangerous things they could transform into. So I'm going to break down... Um, Professor Trelawney's prediction from the end of the book. Quote, It will happen tonight. The Dark Lord lies alone and friendless, abandoned by his followers. His servant has been chained these 12 years. Tonight, before midnight, the servant will break free and set out to rejoin his master. The Dark Lord will rise again and his, servant, and his servant's aid, greater and more terrible than he ever was. Tonight, before midnight, the servant will will set out to rejoin his master, end quote. Um, so that's kind of a lot to unpack, and lots of people would just, you know, overlook lots of it. But it's actually, there's a lot of detail that goes into it. So I feel that when most people are reading it, they're thinking that the prophecy would be applied to, Siri to Sirius Black. And, uh, you know, it certainly fits the bill, but, uh, you know, given the current information at hand, but it's ultimately a red herring. Uh, you know, Sirius's name is cleared. Um, most people would assume that um, it's actually referring to Pettigrew instead. In actuality, I do believe that it's um, referring to Barty Crouch Jr. And I'll probably expand on this a bit more in the next review of uh, Goblet of Fire. But the long and the, sh and the short of it is, is that Barty's uh, dying mother swapped his place in Azkaban so that he could escape uh, and was imprisoned in his father's house for that period of time. He escapes, and that is why Crouch Sr. is always looking over his shoulder in the fourth book. That happened about the same time as the events with Sirius, Pettigrew, and the trio. <clears throat> People always assume that it was Wormtail, but in the next book, it all comes out in the wash. Sure, Wormtail helped, and uh, he but he was never in chains, and thus never needed to break through, break free, as he could have left Ron's care at any point in time. He was also truly never a servant to Lord Voldemort either. He was just a coward that betrayed his friends out of fear. So, had Barty Crouch not uh, impersonated Mad Eye Moody and aided in a largely convoluted plan to get Harry to the graveyard. Voldemort perhaps wouldn't have returned at that point in time. Truly nothing that Wormtail did helped to the degree that Crouch did. And when he came back to the graveyard, Voldemort refers that he had his most faithful supporter uh, at the school, but did not name him. Uh, and the twist comes in the following chapters of, of book four. He was not referring to Snape, who at the time was on the side of the good in the eyes of the Dark Lord. And uh, Voldemort says that he will kill him, but he doesn't explicitly name Snape. Uh, and if you look at it, Snape does need to regain the trust of Lord Voldemort down the line, especially when it comes to the events of book six. Crouch uh, has the most risky and crucial part of the plan to get Voldemort back in power. And that's why the prophecy is referring to Barty Crouch Jr., not Sirius and obviously not Pettigrew, um, as most would think. So again, I'll probably touch upon this uh, this topic in the next book and movie review as well. 
Lupin's explanation for his cover as a werewolf seems like there could have been an easier solution. Like, is there not just a room in the dungeons of the castle that he could safely go to transform and, you know, they could put some enchantments on it and, and, you know, keep students safe. But they actually decide to sneak him into a house at the end of a tunnel guarded by a mad tree. It just seems like a bit overcomplicated and unnecessary. Uh, Snape is also particularly not nice in this book, especially towards the end of it. So he was hiding and listening to Snape and uh, to Lupin and Sirius explain the scenarios while under Harry's invisibility cloak, and still refuses to listen to them after the fact. And I know and I understand that they didn't get along and they're at school. But if Snape trusts Dumbledore to the degree that he does, why wouldn't he give Lupin at least the benefit of the doubt that he was telling the truth about Sirius? And that is it for the review of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Did I miss anything or get something wrong? Please let me know in the comments. Share this with a friend who likes Harry Potter. I'm doing a Harry Potter themed episode once a month uh, for the main book series and I'll talk about a few other subjects in some other episodes as well. Uh, so subscribe uh, wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure that you enable notifications so that you get notified when I post new content. Thanks for listening and have a good day. Don't let the muggles get you down. The ones who love us never really leave us. Mischief managed. Stay free. Thank you for listening to the Schmidt House podcast. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so by sending Bitcoin. The wallet address is in the description box below. I would really appreciate it as I try to keep the podcast ad free and it helps me cover production costs. The Schmidt House podcast is available on the following services, YouTube, Rumble, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Please like, share, and subscribe and, and enable notifications, but most importantly, share this podcast with a friend by copying the link and sending it to them personally. Check out the description box for more information about things I discussed on this episode and how to get in contact with me. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions or suggestions that you may have, including topics that you would like to hear me discuss. Take it easy and have a good day.